I have one little story that I forgot to tell you. I hope you can stand one more gory one. <laughs> um, when Jesse was about 10 years old, we were in the grocery store one day, and as I went around do, doing my shopping, he disappeared to entertain himself. And when I finally approached the checkout, he caught up with me and uh, started begging. He had something behind his back. Mom, please, would you get me something? I want it really bad. Please, please. What, Jesse? Oh, please say yes. I said, well, I won't until you tell me what it is. So he brings out from behind his back a beef heart. <laughs> He'd been down to the meat counter. I said, why do you want that? He said, oh, please, I want it for a science experiment. <laughs> well, what could I say? <laughs> he knew which buttons push. Uh, so uh, it was only 2 or $3, so I got it. And it wasn't a whole one. It was most of a heart. So we took it home, and he spread it out on the kitchen table and began to cut into it. And I kind of hovered around for a while, pointing out, you know, this is a vent called a ventricle, this is the auricle, and here's the uh, a valve, and here's a coronary artery, and other parts, you know, and so forth. And mostly it's just a great, great big muscle. And he sliced away and probably spent a couple hours at it, and then he fed it to the cat. <laughs> and I didn't think too much about it. Well, that was a nice little physiology, physiology lesson. Until a few weeks later, when suddenly Grandpa had to go to the hospital with emergency um, heart surgery. Um, when you go in, they don't always know what the problem is. And in this case, they had to do an angiogram. But it was with the understanding that once they were in there and found out what the problem was, he might have to go directly into surgery without any more preparation. So that's what happened. And he had to have a bypass and, and uh, so on. And so, of course, the family gathered around and we're all there. Um, when he was in the recovery room, still hadn't come to yet, the surgeon came down to talk to us and explain the procedure, how he'd taken a um, vein out of his leg and had, or, or an artery and had uh, patched the heart and um, what he'd done and how and so forth. Well, we were all just, you know, totally intent trying to take in everything he was saying, trying to understand, you know, all his uh, fancy language about uh, the heart and um, straining our intellects to keep up with this surgeon that was explaining it all. We weren't paying any attention to the little 10-year-old boy standing there taking it all in. Uh, but a few, you know, half hour or so, an hour later, Grandpa finally came to. And of course, the first thing he wanted to know is what did they do? What happened? Had he had the surgery and what, what all had happened? Well, Jesse had run down to the nurse's station and found a, down there they had a plastic model of the heart. He brought it back and proceeded to explain to Grandpa everything the surgeon had said. And I was amazed until I remembered the dissecting. He had had a heart in his hands a few weeks before. And so it was all relevant. It all made sense to him. And he could explain it better than we could. So don't overlook any opportunity for your child to have some firsthand experience in this area. Now, what are some good health habits that we need to talk about? OK, Nutrition. hygiene, yes? Brushing your teeth and washing your hands is a major concern for children. OK, yes? I was always a real stickler about my children washing their hands. And my son went out in the kitchen, and our basement is doors by the kitchen. And he went out there, and I said, wash your hands. And he says, Mom, I'm just walking through. <laughs> well, perhaps we need to be more specific about why. Oh, 
explain all the germs. Well, we talk about germs, but what is germs? What does that mean? In fact, does washing your hands kill germs? No. Well, it doesn't kill them anyway, unless you use strong chemicals. Uh, but it does eliminate them somewhat. It gets rid of most of them. There are some organisms that are larger than bacteria, though, and they are very critical to our health, and we often don't talk about them. Does anyone have any idea what I'm referring to? Bacteria? No, not bacteria, but something else that's even more important that we wash our hands for. Viruses? Nope. Well, washing your hands won't get rid of very many viruses. I'm referring to parasites. In this country, people are healthy, well-fed. It isn't that they don't exist, but we don't talk about it, and people don't know about it. Nevertheless, uh, every year, many people lose their lives to them, but at least they get sick. In other countries, third world countries, where people are not so well fed, it's a matter of life and death. And so there you find campaigns to educate children about parasites and about the importance of washing your hands every single time. Uh, the, the life cycle of a parasite is a little more complex than you would realize. Uh, the first time the parasite gets inside of you, it may not do a lot of damage just kind of hangs out in your intestine and uh, eventually lays eggs and so forth, and these are eliminated. But if you don't wash your hands after using the bathroom, you reinfect yourself now with a different stage of the life cycle of the parasite, at which time it gets into your bloodstream, can inf infect your heart, your lungs, your brain, and cause major damage. Yes? Uh, we spent some time in Guatemala several years ago, and um, the shoes on your feet was another way to prevent. Yeah, parasites. hookworm will hookworm. will mm -hmm. go right up through your skin. Right. They lost a lot of children. Um, they had a very high mortality rate for their children because of parasites. Yeah. Strictly, everything had propaganda of some nature. You go to the movies, and the, instead of having commercials in between, they have lectures on, on how to avoiding how parasite infection. <coughs> yeah. So, it, it, you know, when I was eight or seven or eight, I remember my mother, I thought she was, you know, had a fixation on the subject of washing your hands. Oh, every time I came to the table, did you wash your hands? Did you wash both hands? Did you use soap? She was on to me by now, you know. <laughs> yeah, Mom, I stuck both of them under the water. <laughs> Uh, but later, when I learned about this subject, I became as fastidious as she was about washing my hands. It's really important. But children need to know. You just don't get away with saying, well, because I told you so, because they'll find a way to cheat. <laughs> All right. Now, someone said brushing your teeth. Why do we brush our teeth? Yes? Well, not only to... Uh keep our, ourselves healthier because, you know, when, when the bacteria and stuff grows in your mouth, we do end up getting sick. But it also keeps, you know, our teeth healthy. And so our children have learned that through experience that, uh, especially the younger one, he wouldn't let me help him brush his teeth. He said, no, I'm, I can do this myself. Well, at his checkup, he had a slight little cavity, and so the, the, the dentist assistant proceed to say you have to let your mother help and this is how I've, you know you've got to show her how to do it well from then on you know he, he had a little bit better appreciation unfortunately it took a cavity to do it mm -hmm. well now I I apologize for bursting your bubble here but I have a different view of the subject um, I think I'm gathering that your answer to my question is that you brush your teeth to avoid cavities is that right no 
not just the cavities. Um, Does anybody not have bacteria in their mouth? No, it constantly. Okay, so brushing your teeth doesn't get rid of bacteria. It does help control it to some degree. I doubt it. But anyway, I mean, naturally, uh, we're supposed to have bacteria in our mouth. It's there for a reason. Now, but bear with me a minute. Does anyone know someone who brushed faithfully, <coughs> thoroughly, and still got cavities? Mm -hmm. Okay, some of you do. Does anyone know a person who never brushed their teeth and never had a cavity? Some of us know people like that. Is it possible, I mean, just bear with me a minute, is it possible this is propaganda and that certain dentists with an interest in the toothbrush manufacturing and toothpaste have a reason for you to brush faithfully that has nothing to do with the health of your teeth? But if you don't brush your teeth effortlessly and you get the tartar buildup, then you are going to get the periodontia disease, which will then eat at the bone and you will lose your teeth. I've just gone through uh -huh. I worked in the dental field for six years and I saw more problems with periodontia due to the tartar buildup that would get up underneath the gums and the bacteria would then start to eat away at the bone and you actually lose bone, um, you actually lose the bone. But I've also been around people who never got periodontal disease either. And that brushing has nothing they to do with it. Brush? How do they keep the tartar from going up into the gum line, up into the bone? In the well, it's kind of away. like ADD. It's an invented term. I happen, bear with me a minute, and you don't have to buy any of this, but I happen to have a friend who is a professor of dentistry at a university, state university in the South. And he shared some of this stuff with me. And I've also read and researched the subject elsewhere. And the health of the teeth is not on the outside. It's from the inside. It's from the inside, just like every other part of your body. You don't keep from catching cold by taking a shower every day. In fact, bathing has a, not a whole lot to do with your health in general. Oh, you smell better. and. Yeah, you could get some skin disease, I suppose, if you really neglected yourself under certain circumstances. But, you know, the Eskimos don't jump in the ice water every day and so on. But what you eat, what goes inside of you, does have a big bearing on your general health as well as the health of your teeth. In fact, the teeth are not little rocks perched on your jaw. They are living tissue. And we know about the nerve in the middle, you know, the part that bleeds when you're a kid and you lose your baby teeth. But all the way out to the surface of the tooth are little tubes that carry fluids, not blood because it's too, you know, the blood cells are too large to go through these tiny little tubes, but nevertheless carry fluids that keep the tooth alive and healthy. Now, if you eat junk food or don't live healthily, don't get enough sunshine and fresh air and on, on and on, these little tubes will get plugged up. And then just like in a coronary situation, that part of the tooth dies. Then the bacteria that is supposed to be in your mouth and is there for a reason, do what they're supposed to do, clean out the dead tissue. That leaves a cavity. According to my dentist friend, if you change your lifestyle, if you start eating healthfully and getting more sunshine and exercise and so forth, your health will improve, your dental health will improve, and it will actually heal the cavity. It will seal it off, may fill it in a little bit, it won't fill in a big, huge cavity, of course, but it'll seal it off, it'll scar over, just like any other part of your body will. And then, of course, if there's still a cavity there, though it's healed and sealed, the food will collect and it'll start smelling bad. And for, so for cosmetic and other um, reasons like that, 
uh, it's maybe a good idea to brush your teeth, but it's not going to do a whole lot for the health of your teeth. That is from the inside. Um, I just recently read an article on toothpaste and from some leading expert, and I can't quote who they were because I don't remember, that toothpaste, they have become aware that it is harmful and sometimes poisonous to children. Right. Well, it has a lot of stuff in it, including, including grinding compound, which jewelers use to polish jewels. It can, they put that in toothpaste, which grounds down your, grinds down your enamel. And then getting back to the nutritional fact is, I have clients that come in and say, my hair is rotten, my nails are rotten, my skin is rotten. Well, educating them back to this comes from within. Yeah. I can give you everything you want to put on your yeah. hair, your skin, your nails to make you look better, but it's not going to solve the problem. It's getting down to education. Mm -hmm. What you put in your mouth is going to take care of the problem. All of a sudden, a little light comes on and go, well, what can I get? Mm -hmm. I usually end up sending them to a health food store mm -hmm. for her. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's the only thing that works is, is a, a conscious effort to live healthfully and that will take care of a lot of problems. And it goes even beyond the diet. It goes, you know, it, it also goes for exercise and sunshine and fresh air. And, you know, in an environment like this isn't particularly healthy. Um, a, a natural environment is m more healthy. And also, don't forget mental health. You know, the state of our mind has a lot to do with it. If you're convinced that if you don't brush your teeth, you'll get cavities, your teeth will probably oblige and produce cavities, you know. But um, uh, some of it is genetic, and we can't do a whole lot about our genes, you know. What if we inherited bad teeth or bad hair or whatever it might be? Um, we can optimize this, what we have, and that's about it. Now, I don't expect you to, to necessarily agree with me in this class. I hope that if nothing else, you get the idea that it's okay to question authority uh, and not to be dependent on professionals. Feel free to question what I say, but you better have a good argument <laughs> because I can, I've got my stuff researched. All right, back there first. Um, have you ever studied, the, uh, since we were talking about teeth, the teeth of, of people in other countries that don't eat the junk food we eat that have better well arts. not only that but if you go back and and, and research uh, um, you know fossil remains and and uh, archaeological situations you know how people uh, when they've when they, they have unearthed uh, Incas and people beyond even farther back than that and look at their beautiful teeth. I've never studied it, so I yeah. Don't know. And animals, wild animals in nature, they don't worry about things like that. I mean, they, they're. But 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 of course, there's a lot of other. What? Well, sure, they are they are in an artificial environment. Range horses are not very likely to, but but we also have to take into account the impoverished soil the mineral deficiencies in our diet because of that. You know, there's a lot of factors. It's not just a simple, uh, clear-cut issue. It's, it's very complex. But it's, it, it affects all of our health, not just our teeth. Uh, but, you know, brushing your hair, it, it may help your hair a little bit, but it's not going to change it if you've been abusing your health otherwise. Anyway, I'm sorry. I don't want to take away business from Dennis, but. <laughs> no, I have a question. Yeah. My 18-month-old uh, has a knack of losing her toothbrush all the time, so she, she, her teeth have really been neglected as far as brushing them compared to my other ones. And um, I look at them, her breath is never bad, mm -hmm. and her teeth look great. Do you, would you just say not worry? About it? Well, that's what I've done with mine, and some of them have developed cavities, and some of them have beautiful teeth without any cavities. It, the trouble is, they get to be teenagers, and they get out there with their peers, even when they're homeschooled, this happens, 
and uh, they start eating junk food and stuff, and then their teeth deteriorate. Though they may have had really good teeth before that. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let's move on. Uh, was there another hand up? I think we we better keep going here. I just want you to know I have no confidence. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay. What are some harmful habits that we need to talk about? Well, we just touched on that nutrition and kids depending on junk food to give them comfort or satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, those that are concentrating on eating the right thing, uh, not necessarily um, what government terms as healthy, but eating the right food yeah. uh, make a big difference in our health. Okay, um, it, for this part of the discussion, what I had in mind was more, and that's the valid point, eating junk food, uh, but what about habits like um, smoking and drinking and doing drugs and so forth? We need to talk to our children about this, don't we? Yes? My husband was a heavy drinker, and, and somebody told him one day that alcohol kills brain cells, and he never had another drink after that. He said he didn't have any to spare. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and then I have reminded my children that uh, any substance that we become dependent on is harmful. And maybe even not even a substance, but an activity. You know, some people become hooked on eating obsessively. Anything that, that we do to excess is harmful. And so um, any substance that is addictive is not good for us either. And so sometimes I see in a class like this, people uh, get kind of smug, if they're, especially if there's a smoker in the midst, and forgetting that those people are enslaved. They really hardly have a choice. While at the same time, these people with the smug looks are guzzling their caffeine, you know, that they're hooked on too. Well, it seems like it, <laughs> anyway. So let's talk to our children about this. Do they want to be enslaved by anything? Um, do they want to just look cool because, you know, indulge in stuff just for the prestige or the pressure that their ki friends are putting on them and so on? What, uh, what are their values based on? How do they make these kind of choices and so on? because one thing will lead to another. I hope that we always remember that our actions speak louder than words. But nevertheless, if you are already enslaved by some kind of a habit like that, talk to your children about what it's like to be on that end of things so that they won't, so at least they'll be discouraged from imitating your actions. Are those bad? Anything to excess, yes, but sometimes what we interpret as excess may be just enthusiasm on their part. Um, bear with me a minute. Uh, my parents wouldn't let me play games because they thought it would be addictive and that I'd turn into a gambler. Uh, so I didn't learn to play chess until I was an adult. And guess what? Well, I became addicted. <laughs> that is for a while. Uh, it was fascinating to learn to play ch chess and, and uh, master that game, and I, I kept begging the kids to play another game with me, and uh, day after day I, I couldn't get by without two or three games. Now it's the same with solitaire now. But um, eventually I reached a plateau, at which point I didn't seem to be making much more progress, and then I lost interest in it, and I haven't played chess for a long time. Now I play solitaire. <laughs> now, um, so it, it is the way we learn, by immersing ourselves, some people more than others. And children, you, if you watch, if you can stand to watch for a while, you'll see that they will be 
addicted, quote unquote, to something for a while. And then they'll lose interest in it and go on to something else. And it's about the time that they have mastered it. It was really hard for me at first because of my upbringing to, to stand back and watch. And when my, uh, one of my boys became, as I thought, addicted to the computer, I was, I was really upset about it. But their dad kind of held me at bay and said, just, it's okay, he's all right. Um, I would insist periodically that he get up and run around the house a few yeah. times so that his body didn't deteriorate completely <laughs> while he exercised his mind. But nevertheless, uh, you know, after three years of playing every video game, I mean, computer game that he could get his hands on, that was the end of it. And he went on to other things and then ended up in the hotel business. So be careful. Remember what I said earlier, children are not malicious. They aren't uh, necessarily addicted just because they spend a lot of time on something. Maybe they're learning. And in fact, it's been said that um, the Air Force has determined that children who have spent a lot of time with video games and so forth have such finely developed motor skills and eye-hand uh, eye coordination that they make excellent pilots. Mm -hmm. and, and they've noticed this change in, in the crop of young people that apply for jobs in the Air Force. So what did your son, is that all he wanted to do, or did he like get up and, and do other things, or I mean? That's um, all he wanted to do, that and read Mark Twain. Did you limit how much time? Well, I wanted to, but his dad said, leave him alone, and so I did, and for three years, for three years that's what he did. My second son, he gets, he becomes obsessive with games, and I know it's because he wants to master them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I a learning process. Myself doing it with Tetris or something. Yeah. But it's how we learn. Now, if you just learned a new recipe, you'll bake it until the family's sick of it, because that's how you master it. If you just learned a new stitch, crochet, or whatever, you'll do it over and over until you master it. That's how we learn. Do you have a certain bedtime or anything? Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my nephew, but he comes to class, he'll find it really learn. Well, you know, that's what was done to us. So we tend to do it to our kids. I don't do it during the day, but if I get to let him, my nephew, when he's, he'll stay up till four in the morning and play any of these games. I have to take the controller and say, it's bedtime now, go, you need sleep. And, and what would happen if he didn't? Well, May I about. suggest an experiment? <laughs> A scientific experiment, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> let him try it. And then, when he's all grouchy and crabby the next day, say, um, it's your choice, but I suggest that if you go to bed early, you won't feel so miserable later. <laughs> you know, because then it'll be his choice, and he'll, it won't be you controlling him. It will be genuine self-control. Too often, we think that we teach children self-control by controlling them, and that doesn't work. Yes? What do you think about um, music? There's some music that's healthy and some that's not. Yes, definitely. It's been proved that even plants will reject certain kinds of music and grow away from them. Even though the sun's coming in that window, they'll grow away from it. Can you apply that same kind of philosophy, though, that eventually they won't want that kind of music? Not necessarily, because we're now moving from a desire to learn to an addictive behavior which in general represents a way of dealing with pain. A, 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 a healthy person doesn't usually become alcoholic. It's usually someone who's dealing with pain of some sort in their life. De you know, depression, uh, low self-esteem, uh, heartbreak, whatever. Those are the kind of people. And so children who, who are in pain either because they don't get enough attention or because they have some conflict or some other problem in their life, um, they may not have access to alcohol or other types of substances, but they may sit in front of the television for hours and hours. I know when, when uh, my marriage was falling apart, the children spent a lot of time watching television, and I at first felt bad about it, and then I realized it was, well, it was cheaper and maybe perhaps not as dangerous as a drug. And once the pain began to go away and they began to heal, they didn't watch television anymore. 
They didn't need that. So perhaps the music functions that way. It helps them to drown out the pain in their life. I mean, that's one way of looking at it anyway. It's just that so for so long we've dealt with all these issues as if it was all black and white, right and wrong, and so on, without looking more deeply into the cause and effect and, and so forth. Yeah. We did an experiment, if you will, at home with music. And um, because my oldest daughter was listening to some questionable music. And so we put her on a Christian music diet, if you will, for 30 days. And that's all she listened to. And she was really good and stuck with it. And in 30 days, we noticed an incredible change in attitude. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And she noticed it mm -hmm. as well. Since that time, she doesn't very rarely listen to her secular radio station anymore. But it took, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't me saying, oh, you listen to that music and you act like a brat. And, yeah. You know, no, that won't commit say, to okay, look, would you give this a try for 30 days? Yeah, the same thing was, works with diet. You tell the children, okay, today for one day you can have all the sugar you want. You'll be peeling them off the ceiling by the end of the day, and they'll be tearing each other apart, and they'll be miserable, and the next day when you say, well, what do you think? They'll say, ah, no more sweets for us. You know, they will be convinced. That is natural learning. <laughs> all right. Well, we need to move along. Um, cleanliness not only of our bodies and our premises, but also of our environment, <clears throat> clean air, pure water, and so on. First aid and CPR, we've talked a little bit about this. It's important that our children understand these things. Of course, they'll be around when emergencies happen. Instead of being away at school, they will be learning all the time. Uh, and mental health, sometimes it's a matter of choosing to have the right attitude. Or sometimes people get into a habit or a rut. Maybe they had a few days when they were under the weather, and then it became a habit of criticizing and complaining all the time and looking at the dark side. Well, habits can be changed. And sometimes I've said to my boys, get in the habit of saying something nice. Every time you want to say something critical about someone, say something nice instead, and you'll feel differently. It'll affect your own feelings. And of course, how you deal with life's crises, a death in the family, an accident, a major illness, this is how your children will learn to deal. You are modeling coping skills, and so be aware of that and be sure you choose correctly. If you just bottle it all up inside and try to get by, it's not healthy for you, but it's going to be devastating to your children. How often do we see children, for example, at funerals? It's rare, isn't it? Why? Yes? Most parents choose to protect, if you will, their children from the experience. But I found that. Uh, if, if you go where they can see that it's real, not necessarily body, you know, depending on the situation, but where they're able to talk with other people who are grieving. Where they and can see people their, grieving. Yeah, where they're able to they need to experience it. Them. It's part of life. Death is part of life. And, and if you have a, a belief in a, you know, that, that helps you through these times, then you should share that with your children. Uh, if you don't, perhaps you need to look around and find something that is comforting to you. Uh, share it with your children. They need to be there and experience these things and see how people cope with very life-shaking situations because then they will learn. If they're not able to handle it, nature has a way of shutting it out. Children will tune it out if they can't handle it. So I, I believe it's better to expose them to it if they're willing to do that. I think that maybe um, they handle it better. I've only been to one funeral in my life. It was my father-in-law's. And um, 
my older two children were there and we kept the little one home and since then have regretted that mm -hmm. and he should have been with us mm -hmm. but um, Melissa kept looking around and spirituality wise we have always told her about God and Christ and when you die you go to heaven and she could not understand why we were so upset mm -hmm. and she came and gave us a hug and told us it was okay and she went and got candy and put it in grandpa's pocket because he always had candy in his pocket mm -hmm. and told us don't worry he's in heaven and we'll see him someday and I, she didn't cry I mean she just Mm -hmm. And once she she calmed me down, so my, I, you know, I was mm -hmm. devastated. She was just fine with it. She was a real blessing. Okay, good. Okay, uh, well, we didn't get too far down the road here. Let's take a little break, a quick break now, <laughs> and then we'll continue. All right. Just before else. we go for a break, what is oh, the question? Well, Oh, no. What? Oh, immunizations. Immunizations. You were talking about the propaganda yeah. of things, and I've often wondered if that's... Oh, yeah. Well, I never immunized my children, but that's my opinion. And uh, I definitely recommend that if you have a question about it, you should research it, because there's a lot of literature uh, on both sides of the issue, for that matter, but generally we only see one side of the issue. Billboards, you see it everywhere. It makes me just want to back off and say what's going on yeah. here. Yeah. It's such a pressed mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? <laughs> About earth sciences. The best way to study the earth, of course, is to travel upon it. And we don't have to go too far. I'm told that the state of Washington contains just almost every sort of terrain that exists in the world. And while I know where the Arctic tundra is on Mount Rainier, and, uh, and of course we're familiar here with the alpine forests and the desert, and over on the Olympic Peninsula is the rainforest and the seashore and all of that, I still haven't found a tropical jungle, though. <laughs> Not in the state, unless you talk about the conservatory up on the hill. <laughs> there actually is. A tropical jungle. Well, a mock tropical jungle in the lower Columbia, down there in the Carson Stevenson area. Um, orchids, wild orchids actually grow, and they're almost as beautiful as the Hawaiian orchids are. Yeah, well, now we have lady top. slippers, which are orchids, up here. Yeah, well, they're a little different than the lady slippers, but they're, they're almost in the same splendor as, as the, the fine. The and fine where is this? It's in the lower Columbia Gorge area in the Carson Stevenson area. And that almost has mock tropical. I have to climates. get down. I've always wanted to explore that part of the state, and the homeschoolers have never invited me over there. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, I'll take your word for it. There is a tropical jungle in Washington. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of mock. It's, it's uh, under certain mm -hmm. circumstances Semi. And, and the right conditions, it'll be almost tropical light mm -hmm. because uh, that, uh, with all this rain in the night lately, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, can, we can visit these places and talk to our children about uh, the, the earth we can visit Mount St. Helens and talk about volcanoes. Uh, there are caves up north. There are uh, many geological formations in the Columbia Gorge and the Dry Falls area and so on. So um, take advantage of your freedom now, since they're not in school, to travel and visit these places and learn. Another way to learn about the Earth is to read the lives of famous explorers. Marco Polo traveling across Asia, Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigating the globe, Admiral Byrd visiting the poles, or Edmund Hillary climbing Mount Everest and so forth. These are wonderful adventure stories, fascinating to read, but you learn about the earth also. You learn about uh, the terrain that they traveled on. Uh, you need a globe if you're going to study the Earth. So I brought my little portable globe here. Um, I hope you get a better one than this, but it serves for the purpose of the class. Uh, with a globe, you can show your child how the Earth is, first of all, round. 
and that, uh, oh dear, now it's really deflated. Well, anyway, and, and you can show the relationship of the, for example, if you, if you look at the Earth from the North Pole perspective, you see quite a bit of land. If you look at it from the South Pole perspective, outside of Antarctica, there is not much land. It's mostly water. And likewise, if you look at it from the Atlantic side, you see a lot of land. And you look at it from the Pacific side, and it's all water. So it's really lopsided, isn't it? No wonder it wobbles. <laughs> and then the relationship. Well, you can demonstrate if you have a lamp, you need a, a, a not this kind of a globe to show the effect of the sun and the moon. But if you have a, a you know, solid globe, you can use a lamp and a baseball or a tennis ball or something, or an orange or whatever, to represent the, the moon and, and the sun and how an eclipse happens. You might want to experiment a little with this to, and demonstrate it to your children. Um, and then the relationship of the different continents and the places in the world to each other. For example, without looking at the globe, what is your sense of the relationship between, say, the United States and Europe? Or let me put it this way. When you picture the Mediterranean, do you see it as across from Maine or across from New York or across from Florida? When you Florida. think of the Mediterranean. Florida. OK. Anybody else? Do you, do you have a, do you know what I'm talking about, the Mediterranean Sea? OK. Maybe you've never looked at a map, and this doesn't even interest you. But I hope it does, because uh, when the world keeps shrinking, not literally, of course, but in the sense that more and more people travel, and, we, and the news brings us to all these different places around the world, we need to have some sense of it. And so if you, if you think about the Mediterranean, and you notice here it is, over here. And if you follow these lines across, you'll see that it's actually up here in the northern reaches. In fact, uh, Italy comes really right across from Boston and uh, almost into Maine. And then the southernmost reaches of the Mediterranean are all together north of Florida. Isn't that weird? Considering that they grow oranges and you know tropical fruits in uh, Spain and Italy and so on. It's, it's quite a bit farther north than Florida. Um, I was teaching this class in OMAC one time, and there was a Dutch family there. And so since it was appropriate, I talked about Holland and where was Holland in relationship to America. And they thought it was kind of right across from, well, our latitude here in Washington. And they grow tulips over uh, in Mount Vernon, huge tulip fields over there. And so the mother, who was not Dutch, but her husband was, uh, she had kind of figured that Holland was kind of over there about where we were as far as the north and the pole and the equator was concerned. But when she started following it around, or I did in the class on the globe, we see that this is this line is north of Washington State, 45th parallel, I think it is. No, it's the 50th parallel. We're at the 48th parallel. The, the line divides the US and Canada is the 48th parallel. So this 50th parallel here is way north of the nether I mean south of the Netherlands. The Netherlands being up here. And she said, wow, she didn't realize they were that far north. How is it that if we're at the same parallel or opposite that, for instance, uh, tropical fr or uh, citrus fruits can grow <coughs> on that side of the, you know, that parallel that they can't hear? Because of the ocean currents uh, that warm the climate. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes all the difference. Uh, for two years of the time that I was growing up, 
Uh, most of my life was in Chile. And for two years, that when I was down there, we lived on the southernmost city of the world, down on the Straits of Magellan, the tip, down here in the tip of South America. It was very remote, fascinating place, and one that I always felt was home of all the places that I lived. That's the one I wanted to go back to, and I always wondered why. Never did get back there. Uh, you know, it's not too far from Antarctica. But, uh, but when you remember that most of the land is on the north end, and so even though it's down here, it's still quite a ways farther up. The, the same latitude here is about like uh, Juneau, Alaska. You know, here's this la line, and here's uh, this line. So uh, anyway, it's about the 53rd parallel. And it wasn't all that cold. The waters were freezing year round. You, if you fell into the ocean, they gave you two minutes. After three minutes, you'd be dead. It was so, so cold. But the climate wasn't all that cold. We never had more than about eight or 10 inches of snow, and it was kind of dry anyway. Lots of wind. Um, and then I visited Ireland, and I felt at home again. And I realized that I'd been genetically imprinted with <laughs> my Irish ancestors had made me feel at home at the 53rd parallel, only this is north instead of south. <laughs> the daylight, you know, the, how much sun in the summertime and, and darkness in the wintertime was the same in, in Cork, Ireland, where my ancestors came from, as it was way down here in the tip of South America. So anyway, the relationships. This is uh, interesting study for your, perhaps you can get your children warmed up to that, especially if they travel or their relative, maybe grandma and grandpa have been around, talk about something relevant. The weather. You can keep a weather diary. This is a fun project for a younger child, especially if you buy some little stickers of sunshine faces and cloudy faces and stick them on the calendar, let them choose what the day brought. Geology, we've touched on. How about astronomy? Did any of you get to watch the falling stars the other night? Good. How many of you got to see the comet earlier? Homeschoolers were all out there more than any other segment of the population, I think, studying astronomy when, the, when that was in the news. So watch for opportunities. What? The northern lights are very active this time of year, too. OK. Also, time to. Mirror, Pardon me? Mirror, the station. The oh. Station yeah. We watched that just the night before I mm -hmm. drove up here. OK. We home on Saturday, Saturday night. We watched it. Mm -hmm. Just across the sky. How did you know which one it was? It's, it's kind of difficult to know unless the fact that it's moving faster than the stars. Oh, but how do you know which? Because there's other satellites up there. There's the weather satellites. Because there's the communication it's satellites. It's a lot faster mm -hmm. speed than what they would be moving. Oh. Like our prime I mean, satellite like is always just... in the same spot every night. Mm. OK. But, uh, and, and it's moving. But it's moving about the same speed we are. It's always well, there. Yeah, but Merle was moving at a fast speed. You, you can tell the difference. OK. All right. Um, now, let's move on and get down to the stuff that we think of as science when we think of school. What do you remember studying in science? Um, how many of you, let me put it this way, how many of you studied biology in school? OK, just about everybody. How many of you studied chemistry? That's pretty good. How many studied physics? <laughs> and it's always this way. You know, everybody studied biology. Half the class took chemistry. One or two people took physics. And guess what? Guess which one's the most interesting and practical? Physics. It's all around. You experience it every day. It's a fascinating subject. All right, what did you study in biology? Probably set up a frog. 
<laughs> that right now is a big thing with our kids. It's, it's okay. Kind of what we've already talked about, but what else? I mean, when we really get down to business in high school, what do you study in biology? Okay, first of all, I think the, the first item on the agenda is the classification of animals and plants and so forth, fitting them into families, patterns, whatnot. Okay, and then comes genetics. Remember that? And we can study genetics around the house. You know, if you have a breeding dog or cat, I remember we had a Siamese cat. She was one out of a litter, uh, of a combined litter of 10 kittens. <coughs> and uh, we never did see any other Siamese in the vicinity. But every third litter or so, she would have one Siamese kitten. So it was an interesting study in genetics. You know, here was a recessive gene that keep, kept asserting itself from time to time. And then, of course, the best place to study genetics is at a family reunion. <laughs> you can see where you got your blue eyes or, <laughs> or your long nose or whatever, you know, and compare uh, the different genetic makeup that each one ended up with. Um, microsco microscopic life forms. Do you remember anything about this? Protozoa? Amoeba? Can we do this at home? I hope so. Yes, you can get microscopes. Um, check the medical supply houses. Often they'll have used microscopes as, as they upgrade to the new electronic microscopes. They'll discard their older ones and you can get them for 30 or $40. They're really not as expensive as you would think. And they are very interesting to use. Pond water flies wings and so on. Okay, at least a good magnifying glass so they can fry ants and such <laughs> things like that. And then of course, yes, in this sense, biology is probably the most important. Reproduction, <laughs> remember studying reproduction? Well, what about reproduction of plants? What plants reproduce without seeds? Do you remember? Some trees. What? Some, some trees just have seeds. Which trees? Could be a hybrid tree. Oh, well, now we're not talking about hybrid. We're talking about natural reproduction. There are some plants that have naturally reproduced without seeds. They have something else that they use. Bulbs. No. Bulbs, Bulbs produce Bulbs. seeds. Yeah, but that's, they still produce seeds at some point in their life cycle. Hmm. Even though they pr reproduce that way by offsets, they will still produce seeds, yes. Do they still produce, now see, I can't even retain anything I learned. Do they still produce seeds when, when the bees or the birds are pollinating and they're, they're like, they're taking the fluids from one to the other? Like the so pollen from one to the other. Yeah, the pollen is the seed. No. no. The pollen is the oh. sperm, if you will. Okay. <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. That clarifies. <laughs> okay. No, not, um, the, no, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about spore producing plants. Oh, okay. Mushrooms. Mushrooms, ferns, they don't have seeds, they don't have flowers. They produce, reproduce with spores. Okay. So things that don't have flowers are the spore family. Well, the you know, grasses don't really have flowers, but they do produce seeds. I mean, they have rudimentary flowers, so that in itself you can see. But yeah, the, the plants that don't have any of that sort of reproductive ability produce spores. And for example, the fern have spores on the bottom of their leaves. They don't have a, even a rudimentary flower. Mushrooms, they have the spores inside their caps. And you can, you can show this to the children by doing spore prints. Take a mushroom cap and put it on a piece of paper, leave it for a few hours, maybe overnight in a 
place away from drafts and then carefully lift that cap and there'll be a spore print on the paper. If you don't see one, then maybe the spores are white, so you need to get a dark sheet of paper, to a construction paper or something to do it with. <coughs> so, and, and then there's animals that reproduce um, w differently than we normally think of reproduction. For example, snails can be, they're, they're called hermaphrodites. They can be either male or female. They take turns. I mean, they, they can be both at one time or another, that is, and, and uh, so on. So these are some of the things that we studied in biology. Remember? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it is interesting, and children will be interested if you take it where they're at. You know, if they're out there digging in a pond and they come up with some uh, moss or some uh, algae or something, ask them to consider how this reproduces. How does algae reproduce? Through spores. So does moss. Yes? It hasn't been that many years ago my husband showed me in our garden the boy corn and the girl corn. Mm -hmm. and I was amazed. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some trees that also are male and female trees. And uh, well, some other trees. Some fruit trees. If you don't have with a yellow produce, either one mm -hmm. of them produce. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to chemistry now. I mean, I assume since you all took biology, I don't need to delve into this anymore. At least you have you can go home and look up your book and on biology and try to recover a little bit of what you forgot. What? Because I have my mom's college biology mm -hmm. book. Good. Good. All right, chemistry. What do you study in chemistry? <coughs> the elements, the periodic table of elements. That's the first thing you go through. And uh, is this really vital? Yes? No. <laughs> My kids got a lesson in chemistry last month. <coughs> Potato exploded in the oven because it got cooked too long. And there were no pressure points to alleviate. So they learned how as it got hot, it ex expanded and burst against the skin. So when it, it pushed against the skin, it finally just burst out. Well, they had recently studied about volcanoes, or at least the older ones did. So they related that to the volcanoes and they go, now I get it, because they were trying to understand how the pressure would, would culminate into such a point to where Mount St. Helens blew okay. its top. Okay, th that's a good example of physics, not chemistry. Well, it, it uh, how the heat, yeah. you know, we related it to the heat ah, part. Right. But, uh, okay, but that is physics. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, back to chemistry. <laughs> what are some examples of chemistry in the home? There is quite a bit, actually, in the, in the kitchen, baking. Okay, every time you bake a cake, you're doing a chemical nutrients in the garden reaction yes what about peroxide when you pour it on is that net bubbles is that is that oh, sure <laughs> right what's happening there it's a, it's a reaction and of course there are some dangerous ones you want to be careful about mixing say for example ammonia and bleach major disaster <laughs> if you do so talk to your children about these things read the labels don't mix different chemicals together. Um, you can create a reagent. You know what a reagent is? A substance by which you can detect the presence or absence of, say, acid. Um, take a few leaves of purple cabbage, boil them in a little water, and it'll produce a purple juice. Now, if you pour this juice into little nut cups or some similar containers, then you can use these to test different chemicals in the home. If you, for example, put lemon juice in one of those containers of purple cabbage juice, it will turn pink. If, on the other hand, you put a little Ajax or bleach, anything containing bleach, into the container, it will turn blue. 
and you could try apple juice and you know various other chemicals around the house that the kids try. What happens if you put soap in the purple juice and so on? It's easy for me to, I used to, you know, struggle to remember which was which until I remember that when I add lemon juice to the salad, it, the salad turns pink if it has purple cabbage in it. But if I'm chopping the purple cabbage on the drain board that it wasn't rinsed too well, and there's still some Ajax on there, then it turns blue around the edge. So that's how I remember now. Um, kitchen chemistry. There's even a book by that name. <coughs> Experiments that you can eat is another one. Uh, many years, uh, several years ago, that is, I was um, convicted that there should be a better way to produce baking powder. Now, every time you bake a cake, you're, you're doing a chemical reaction. Uh, it takes soda and vinegar or some other acid and alkaline that you mix, or base, it's also called, that you mix in order to create a reaction. The gas that produces when you mix those two chemicals together in that reaction, the gas raises the cake. But it also leaves a residue, a salt or an ash. And sometimes this isn't good. In fact, most baking powder, besides aluminum, which I don't like, has tartaric acid and soda. Tartaric acid mixed with soda produces a gas that raises your cake, but it leaves a salt called Rochelle salt. And it's a very uh, extremely uh, caustic or acid. Um, anyway, it's, it's not good for you. But of course, it's a small amount, so most people don't notice any harm from it. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. Surely there's some other chemicals that we can mix that produce the same effect. So for years, I experimented. Now, I didn't have any training in chemistry myself. Uh, my spouse did have a year of chemistry, and then I talked to friends who were chemists and so on, and eventually figured out that if we mixed ascorbic acid and soda, we could raise a cake. It didn't raise quite as high, but it never fell. You could throw everything but the kitchen sink in there, and it would raise beautifully. And so I tried baking with that for a while, and it worked. Ascorbic acid and vitamin C. And you can buy it in the powder if you want. So anyway, this, this is just a little to whet your appetite, I hope, in the subject of chemistry. There is a lot of it in the home, in the laundry, in the kitchen, and elsewhere. And it pays to know something about it. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Tartaric acid. Cream of yeah. Okay. yeah. It's the acid crystals left over from grape juice. That's that's the source of it. I can't get this to work right. I don't know. I'll get something stuck, and I remember Grandpa did that, and it does never work right. <laughs> Should have asked. You only learn when you ask. <laughs> Okay, any other comments or questions? I don't want to move too fast here. What do you remember studying about chemistry in school besides the periodic table of elements? There was math. I mean, yeah. Okay, well, that's what I en encountered in the study of physics. I did take physics. And the teacher said, no, you cannot take physics. You haven't had higher math. No algebra, can't take physics. So they put it out of reach, basically. You know, here's the most interesting subject. They put it out of reach. There's plenty of math, or could be anyway, in biology, but they overlooked that. They put physics out of reach of most people. But I already knew enough about physics to be very interested and in wanting to know more. And I insisted that they let me take physics. Sure, I flunked every test because it was all the math formulas that I knew nothing about and didn't care about, really. But I loved physics, and I got an A in lab. 
<laughs> so he was kind enough to let me squeak by with a D. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, what's the grade? You know, I learned so much. It was fascinating. In physics, you start out by studying simple machines. I don't mean um, lawnmowers and washing machines, but we're talking about basic machines in terms of the lever, the wheel, the inclined plane. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those kind of machines, out of which other machines are made. And so you might talk to your children about this. Uh, ask them if they can find an example of a fulcrum or a teeter-totter. Um, how many instances can you find around the house of the wheel? Anything that makes work easy. So sometimes you might want to demonstrate this. If you line up some pulleys and run a rope through them, you can lift a lot heavier load than you could just by reaching over and picking it up. Uh, another example would be to shove a box of toys across the floor as opposed to loading it into a wagon and pulling it. I, I had, used to carry those boxes of books in and out of the class. And one day, my back was complaining and groaning and said, oh, I can't do this anymore. What I need is a cart. So I went down to the second-hand store and found a cart. And what a joy that was. <coughs> now I can roll my boxes in and out at, with much less effort. That's what machines, simple machines are. If you've seen the book by David McCauley, How Things Work, it's about simple machines and, and combinations of them, physics. Next topic is optics. And this has to do with light, the refraction of light, and lenses. And we already talked about what use children find for magnifying glasses, lenses. Um, but have them look at it uh, through a drop of water um, or a pinhole in a box, like a shoe box, and you put a little pinhole in it, and it'll project an image inside that's upside down, things like that. Experiment. You could build a telescope with stuff that you gleaned from the thrift shop. Uh, there's lots of cameras, and you take them apart, take out the lenses, and, and uh, experiment with them. OK, um, next comes acoustics. Light travels at a very fast rate of speed. Sound travels much more slowly, right? You understand that? Every time you have a thunderstorm, you have an opportunity to discuss this. When you see the lightning and then later hear the thunder, you can actually measure the distance. Yes? Well, my husband has always had a bad habit of doing that. He'll see the lightning in the sky, 1,001, 1,002. Mm -hmm. And then he just shows how smart he is about, oh, that was so many miles away. <laughs> but I guess I should just but like uh, just let him do it. I guess sure because the children are learning. Yeah, they're always fascinated by it. All right. Um, what about uh, other aspects of acoustics? Might be the echo effect. If you're out in the hills and you holler and you hear your voice come back to you. You can talk about the echo effect. Um, we had the opportunity to, t to tour the Capitol building in Washington, DC. Uh, Joe was very interested in this because we had been so involved in the Washington state legislature. And then to get to go to Washington, DC and tour that Capitol was very impressive. It's huge by comparison, even though they're similar in architecture. Uh, the whole Washington State Capitol would fit inside the rotunda of the other one, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, it was very interesting. And it was back when Tom Foley was the speaker, so we got preferential treatment being from his district. And uh, so they gave us a 
our own personal guide to show us through and talk about everything. And this uh, young man told us an interesting story about the old Senate chamber room, uh, Senate chambers. This is a part of the Capitol building that's no longer used. It's been converted into a museum. But it's where they met originally while they were still building the, the, those end parts of the Capitol building where they now have the main um, Senate and House floors. So in this room, which had a dome ceiling, is where they used to meet back when it wasn't even Democrats and Republicans, but they were called, well, I don't know, Whigs and Tories and other sorts of things. And uh, he told us an interesting story. He said, when the Senate was meeting in this room, they didn't have any breakout rooms for caucus meetings, and so they just huddled on each end of the room for their caucus meetings. And of course, this is when they get together as a party and talk about their strategy. And the Democrats over here, let's say, because we don't remember what names they were, and the Republicans over here would talk, plan their strategy for getting their bills passed. And during this certain period of time, by way back in the early days, it was, it, what developed was that it seemed like the Democrats, let's say, had a leak. Somebody, or somehow, the Republicans were always a step ahead. They, they sort of knew ahead of time what was going to happen next. So the Democrats started getting suspicious, suspicious of each other. Who's t spilling the beans? Who's telling the enemy over there? <laughs> and it went on for weeks and weeks. I don't remember how long, he probably told us, but um, there was at the same time this sleepy uh, elder statesman, senator, that sat in the back of the room, and uh, they didn't pay too much attention to him. He seemed to be napping most of the time. However, eventually he retired and became president of the United States, and somebody else got his Senate seat, and at that point it was discovered that actually the acoustics of the room had been focusing the sound of what was going on over there on this desk. And the sleepy senator was not napping, he was eavesdropping <laughs> on the other side of the room. He could hear everything that was being whispered in that caucus meeting. And so nobody had spilled the beans. I believe it was one of the Adams, the younger one, I think. So that is an illustration of acoustics. Now, if you ever have a chance to go to something at the Opera House, wait till everybody's starting to leave, and then send your children up there on the stage, or you go up there and have them go to the back, and have them talk in a normal tone. If whoever's up on the stage can just talk and be heard clearly at the very back of the room because of the acoustics of the building. Yes? How long, I was thinking I live in a lot of lake, and at night time, <coughs> sometimes the fish, you know, men go out to fish. If you stand on the shore, they can be way out there, and you can hear every single thing that they're saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, uh, some friends of ours live in a ge geodesic dome house, and uh, that's very interesting. The acoustics in that building, you, you can be standing there by the front door. I was one day getting ready to leave and uh, called to Jesse, come on, Jesse, we've got to go now. Okay, Mom, be right there. And it looked like his voice was coming to me right out of the wall <laughs> because he wasn't there. And I, where's Jesse? And I looked all around. He was up on the third floor balcony. <laughs> looking down, in the, and his voice was bouncing off of these ge geodesic triangles, or whatever they are, um, and being projected in a strange way. So then she proceeded to tell me that uh, it was kind of embarrassing one time when the in-laws were visiting, and they were still up and sitting at the dining room table after they, the family had gone to bed. And pretty soon, Grandma hollered up, Hey, you guys, we can hear everything down here. <laughs> Be careful what you're discussing. <laughs> so those uh, acoustics is fascinating. Children, when they, when they, if they go into a room that's 
kind of hollow and bare, you know, and hear their voice? Or how many of you have sung in the shower? <laughs> because it's so acoustically alive. It just makes your voice sound a whole lot better than it really is. Okay, magnetism. Get your children some magnets to play with. Now, just be warning them that not to take them near any uh, ma magnetic equipment, such as audio tapes, videotapes, um, television screens. Don't go, go near those. Um, but otherwise, you might show them uh, how to create magic. You take a pencil and get some of those little round magnets with a hole in the middle. And if you position them correctly, they will float on each other. So you can have a little discussion on how opposites attract and like poles repel. I remember when I was real little, a friend of ours had some little Scotty dogs with magnets mounted on them. And you could chase one dog with the other one. You know, and if you turned around, then they kissed each other and so forth. Do you remember those? I wish I had them now. But anyway, we, I, I learned then about magnets and, and polarity and so forth. And this kind of leads into electricity, doesn't it? First, static electricity. And it, the kids f find a lot of fun in creating static electricity in the wintertime, you know, scooting their socks across the floor and then touching the doorknob and creating sparks combing their hair and watching it stand on end, uh, rubbing a, a <laughs> balloon and having it stick to the ceiling and all this kind of stuff. Jesse found that, and I'm not sure if this is static electricity or I guess it is. Anyway, he discovered that he could take a fluorescent light bulb, even a dead one, and uh, rub his nylon sleeping bag on it and it would light up. He kept his friends entertained a whole night one time doing this. <laughs> okay. And then electricity. Be careful here. You might start out with batteries. You know, uh, Radio Shack has some wonderful kits that show you how to make all kinds of, you know, radios and uh, crystal sets and sirens and uh, solar powered stuff and on and on. Everything's right there. You just rearrange the wiring. And they learn about the different you know, capacitors and uh, transistors and so forth. Or you could just give them an old defunct television set or radio. Be sure you take out any tubes, especially the screen. And uh, you might want to check with uh, somebody that knows these things how to, how to de uh, electrify because sometimes there's a built-up charge in there that can hurt the child. But once it's really, really dead, give them an old soldering iron, let them take it apart. They'll pretty soon be asking, what are these and what are those? And they're all different colors and shapes and, and they can learn about electricity and, and so on. And then let's talk for a few minutes about the forces and energy of the earth. This is also part of physics and we already had a little story about heat expands, right? Even inside of potatoes. And cold contracts most of the time. Is there an exception? Ice. Yeah. When ice gets cold, freezes, it expands. And it's the only thing that expands when it gets cold as far as I yeah, water. Okay. No, when I freeze fruit, uh, food, foods in the freezer in um, plastic containers, we always leave them short. Is it because the water in the? In the yes, because the water in them expands when it freezes. If if you didn't have any water, if you if you put dry products in there, or even oil. It wouldn't expand, but water expands. Anything else contracts? Yes? Um, I think this is the right topic, but why does a divining rod work? <laughs> and I've asked a few people, and nobody seems to know. No, that's true. Nobody seems to know how it works. It works, but My no. My grandfather liked it with 
In fact, we were discussing that with my friend this weekend about finding law employment. But thanks for bringing that up because it reminds me to tell you what I usually forget is that on this end desk here, all of those things are freebies from the government different agencies, some of us from the forestry department, the posters, for example, the little pamphlets are from the U.S. Geological Survey Office, and what reminded me is that there's one there on water witching. So you might read that and see if it helps answer the question. And the U.S. Geological Survey Office is down in the back of the post office building, and they have lots of material there. And it's most of it, I mean, a lot of it's free. They also have maps and things where you have to pay a little bit, but those pamphlets are free. So can you look up these departments in the phone book? Mm -hmm. and just yeah, in the, under government, in the blue pages. Okay, what are some other forces? Well, we already dealt with electricity and magnets, but um, I'm talking now about forces like centrifugal force, uh, gravity, inertia. Uh, we have a lot of experience with this in the wintertime, don't we? When the I or roads freeze over, we learn about uh, <laughs> momentum. You're going at a certain speed, and you hit an icy spot, and you can't Slam on the brakes, nothing happens. <laughs> you keep moving. Or inertia, when you're trying to push something that's heavy and it doesn't want to budge, it's inertia that's holding it down. Uh, gravity, of course, is familiar, but what about centrifugal force? Have you ever watched children swinging a cat or, or even a bucket full of water and it doesn't fall out? because of centrifugal force. What about this? What force is involved in this? Worms or hands. Well, it sometimes gives us a rug burn or a rope burn or something like that because of friction. These are all part of the forces that we can talk about to our children, the forces that operate in the universe. Uh, centrifugal force and friction and all of this is involved when we send satellites up or the space shuttle or whatever, it's all dependent on these forces. Gravity brings it back. Centrifugal force keeps it from floating out and being lost in the space. And friction causes it to heat up and when it re-enters the atmosphere, yes? Does it cause, does that surprise the ocean does that fall on the Yeah, that's more under Earth sciences because it's being affected by, well, astronomy kind of goes with the Earth, even though it's beyond the Earth, yeah. This morning, um, my son was telling me I was wrong. He that drives in outer space with the near thing, the eight-year-old, he's telling me that uh, it's not because of gravity that they don't come down, it's because there's no air there. It has, he's, he, no, it has nothing to do with lack of gravity, it's lack of air. He just will not. That's okay. That's okay. He's on to something there. <laughs> sure. Right. Um, okay, let's talk about the property of liquids. What happens if you leave the towel hanging out of the bathtub and it's still full? You get it all out on the floor, huh? And... Uh, if you've done any siphoning at all, you know that uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And uh, remember we talked about the, the glass in the dishwater, and, and I mentioned that, that we learned something there that came to play later in life. When, when our, one of our grown sons called up and asked, he said, uh, I bought some property, it has a hill on it, and we want to build a house at the bottom and, and put a well at the top so we'll have gravity flow water. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a nice idea. And Dad said it won't work. Well, he said, how far can we get the water to go up in the, in the pump? You know, if you, if you have a suction pump, that is. Of course, if you have an electric pump, that's different. Um, powered pump. Well, we did a little research and found out that at sea level, a column of water 
I think it's 32 feet high, weighs the same as, as the air in that same column. You know. so, so basically what we're talking about is that the outside, the atmospheric pressure is pushing on the water and holding it up inside of that until it gets to be 32 feet tall. And at that point, it weighs more than the air. So it falls out and leaves the vacuum. And you don't have a pump. So he got rid of the piece of property. <laughs> His idea didn't work. But anyway, um, I learned. You know, when the question came up, that's when we looked it up and found out. Watch for opportunities to do, to come up with these uh, questions and answers. Uh, what are some other properties of liquid? What about, pardon me? Gases? Well, yeah, when, when they get hot, they expand and become gas. When they get cold, they contract until they become solid, at which point they expand again, in the case of water, anyway. But uh, I'm thinking in terms of, um, for example, capillary action. Have you ever noticed when you have a drinking straw in your glass of water that the water inside the straw is a little higher than the surrounding water? Maybe that much in a regular drinking straw. But if you have, a, don't usually have clear ones, but if you had one of those coffee stirrers that was clear so you could see the water, it would actually be this much higher inside that narrower straw because of capillary action. And if you've ever been to the doctor and the nurse drew blood in a little glass pipette, which is a hairline pipe inside of it, then it just goes choom like that. Have you ever seen that? It's just nothing but a little tube. But the capillary action sucks the blood up into it. Now, what is capillary action? It's actually related to surface tension. There, on the surface of water and other liquids, the molecules tend to cling to each other, creating an elastic skin, which is why raindrops are round, because that's the least amount of space that it can contract into. Now, this skin is the surface tension. So inside the straw, the skin tends to cling to the straw and draw the water up. If you took um, there are several ways of demonstrating this to children. Uh, one, one that is quite popular is um, take a bowl of water, sprinkle pepper on it so they can see it, and then touch it with a toothpick. First, I, I always do this first without anything so that they'll see that nothing happens. It's just by touching water with a toothpick. And then I hold uh, some soap and I sit now touch the toothpick toothpick to this magic solution, and now touch the water. Do you know what happens? The pepper goes choo, like that to the, to the edges. It just goes, it breaks the surface tension, and the pepper scoots out to the edges as, the, as that elastic skin retracts. And the children just always go, ah, like that. It's so neat, because they don't expect that. Uh, another experiment using the same principle is what I call the soap boat. Fill the sink with water. Take a little piece of uh, paper, like a, a thicker one, like a three by five card type material. Cut it into the shape of a boat, just a little one, and set it on, well, before you set it on the water, rub a bar of soap on the back end, and then set it on the water, and the boat will go. It will go and go, and it'll finally stop after a few minutes, at which point, if you drain out the water and fill the sink again and then set the boat back down, it'll go some more. What's happening is that the soap makes the water wetter. It breaks the surface tension. That's why we use soap, not to kill germs, but to make water wetter so that it can carry <laughs> off the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so when you set the little soap boat on the water, it's breaking that surface tension where it's at, which causes it to move forward where there's more until finally all the 
elastic is relaxed, so to speak, and then it stops. And you just need to put fresh water in there, and it'll work some more. And kids like that experiment. Remember, this is surface tension. It makes it work. Have you seen the, the little water bugs? where they're, they're, they're standing on the water and the water sort of dents down under their feet. That's surface tension holding them up. You can float a needle on water if you're careful, unless it's soapy water and then it won't work. Another e example of surface tension is when you fill a glass with water and you get it too full and the water sort of stands up above the rim of the glass. If you touch it with a soapy finger, the water will fall out. Anyway, these are, these are just a, a few of the things that you can do in physics. Isn't it fascinating? Don't you wish that it was available to everybody without all that math that you have to take in school? I mean, the math is probably worth something if you're going to pursue this in, in any uh, constructive way beyond just wanting to know. but. Everybody should know something about physics. OK, any question about science and what we've covered this afternoon? Any questions about the assignment, which will be due tomorrow? Can I do it through Pluto Test Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? OK, we'll see you tomorrow.